In this video, we're going to go over material parameterization and using material instances. And that sounds pretty fancy, but it's basically a cool uh, technique we can use to create uh, basically these sort of copies of materials that we can then edit in real time and see the changes update in the viewport instantly instead of having to wait uh, for the updates to occur very slowly the way that we've been seeing it up to this point. So let me show you how this works. It, it'll make a lot of sense once we start getting to work here. So there's a little bit of setup we have to do. For now, I'm just going to set up my view over here so that we can see kind of half the screen the viewport and half the screen the material editor just because I want you to be able to see the uh, how the updates change in relation to the changes that we're going to make. Okay, so how does parameterization work? First, I'll create a one vector node. I'm going to plug it into the metallic. Now, this is just a simple one vector. So if I switch this to one, you'll see nothing happens. In order to get it to update in the viewport, I have to apply the changes, wait for the changes to compile and update, and then I get the update. That can take a few seconds depending on how complex your shader network is in the material. It can take uh, half a second. It can take several seconds. Either way, it, you'll waste too much time if you're sitting here making changes to a complex shader network and waiting for those changes to update every time you change a little number, a color, a value, anything like that. So it's a big waste of time. So what we want to do is we want to work a little bit more intelligently, uh, a little more production focused and more efficient on the pipeline. So the way you would work in an actual studio or in a serious project is you would, um, you would use parameterization to speed up the process of iterating changes on your material. So the way we do that is actually uh, pretty straightforward and actually very, very easy. It's not hard at all. So what I want to do, I want to create a parameter, basically, that I can adjust. And as I adjust it, it's going to instantly make changes on my material. So um, I'm going to go ahead and if I go to the search field up here, I'm going to start to grab a, a node over here. So let's look for constant. I'm going to get a constant one. And the shortcut for that is just to hold down the one key on the keyboard and just left click and you'll create a constant one. So I'm going to right click on this constant one and you'll see this menu item says convert to parameter. Once I select that, you'll see that the node turns green. And if I look at this, I'm just going to maximize this so we can see it a little bit better. But if I look at this, I have a default value, and I can also plug this in anywhere I want. So I'm going to plug it into the metallic. Now, when I select the node and look at the details panel, I can have the, the option to change the parameter name. It's very important to name this stuff and organize it. So I'm going to call this metallic control. And you can call it literally whatever you want. And that's actually what you want to do. You want to name this stuff in a way that makes sense. So if someone looks at your material later, they can quickly and easily make tweaks and stuff uh, without having to guess what in the world you were trying what you were talking about when you named the shader so uh, the parameter node so make sure you use names that are logical and make sense so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this material here which is the main material in the content browser I'm gonna right click on it and select create material instance and that's gonna create a copy of the material but it's not exactly a copy this is called an instance and you'll see at the end of the name it's called INST, which is short for instance. You can always change the name and call it whatever you want. This is just the default naming uh, here, so it doesn't matter. We can change it. I'm going to save. Materials look exactly the same. If I go to the main material, it looks uh, pretty much what we would expect. Now, if I open the material instance, we get a completely different editor, and this is the material instance editor. So here we can't make changes to the actual main material but we can make changes based on the parameters that we've exposed and we'll talk about that in a second so basically I have my little preview window over here on the right which is uh, perfect for seeing the changes which is the same as the preview window over here in the regular material editor both are essentially the same they're gonna let you preview and see the changes you're making so I have the ability to again changes from cubes to spheres cylinders polyplanes, I could turn the grid on and off, I can also cha uh, turn real time on and off so if I have any movement or procedural animation on this thing I'd be able to see it. Then on the left we have the details. Now we can see here's the parent material 
The parent material is the main material that we used to make a copy of this or an instance of it, which is this checkerboard or a checker black material, this one right here. This is the parent material. So we'll go back to the instance and uh, we have some other settings here. Now the main settings you want to look at is the settings under parameter groups. Now if I go back here and I look at this parameter that I created earlier, you'll see the name. It's called metallic control and um, group is set to none and default value is set to 1.0, right? So if I come back here to the instance, I'll see that here's scalar parameter values. Well, look at that. There's a, an actual entry here called metallic control, and the default value is 1. And it's turned off by default, so I'll check it on so that I can override the value. And I'll change the value to 0, and you'll see it update automatically over here on the right. So whatever number I input or whatever changes I make, they're going to propagate instantly without having to wait for the shader to compile. Now what happens with the main viewport if I make changes while I look at this? Well the first thing I need to do is I need to change the material on that little sphere in the viewport. So right now it's using the parent material. What I want to do is apply the new instance material to the object. So the instance material is just like any other material. You want to apply it to the object. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that material, the instance material, to my sphere in the viewport. And you can see I've done that. And this will allow me to see the changes uh, instantly because I'm going to be editing this instance material. So let's go back to the instance material. And in order to be able to see this a little bit better, I'm probably going to want to tear this little menu off here. And I'm going to place this on the right. And this will allow us to see a comparison. So I'm going to change the metallic control here to 0.25. And voila, there you go. See how the changes happened automatically? As I click and drag here in the, uh, in the input field of the metallic control, I can change and alter the metallic control parameter that I created in the regular material node. See that? And as I make the changes, they're going to update automatically and instantly. I don't have to wait for the apply changes to happen. So let me go to the group. Over here we see scalar parameter values. That's a default group if you have this set to none. I'm going to change the name of the group and call it uh, Surface Look. And you can, again, call this whatever you want. When I apply the changes, the material instance over here on the right is going to update. Now, instead of having that scalar parameter group up there, we have a new group called Surface Look. That's the group that we created. So groups allow you to organize your different parameters. So you can have a group for, say, reflectivity and then have a bunch of parameters down for reflectivity that are going to allow you to organize this stuff better. So let me just go in here and create a multiply node. I'm going to plug my texture to that. I'm also going to get a color node and plug that into the second input of the multiply. And let's change this color to like a red. And this is just for, uh, for display purposes just so that I can show you the power of how this stuff works. So I'm going to make this red color. I'm going to multiply it by the texture. I'm going to convert this color node to a parameter. And again, you do that just by right clicking, going into the right click menu and hitting convert parameter. I'm going to change the name to base color because that just makes sense. Again, try to use names that are short, simple, descriptive, and just make logical common sense. I'm going to plug the results of the multiply into the base color. So now I'm changing the color to a red. And what I can do here is change the parameters over here for the base color parameter node. So I'm going to change the group over to surface look. And I'm going to apply the changes. I'm going to jump back into the material instance. And now you see that it's updated. Now we have two items under the surface look group. The base color as well as the metallic control. And as I change the base color, it'll update automatically over here in the preview. Now if we jump back to the viewport, we can actually update this instantly. See that? As I change the color, the color updates right away at the speed of light. So I don't have to sit there and wait for this stuff to update or, or think or load or compile or do any type of calculations. If I want to reset this to default, 
just click on the little uh, yellow arrow icon over here on the right looks like a little arrow making a u-turn if you click on that your defaults um, or your parameter are going uh, to switch over to defaults so that makes it pretty handy in case you chose a color and you're like eh, I like the default color better just hit that little yellow icon and you'll default it back to red or blue whatever it was inside of the parent material so pretty cool so what you can do is the power of this is in the way that you organize and set this up so I can create dozens and dozens of these parameter nodes that control every facet of my material I can parameterize all of this to so see that I could take another parameter this is a one vector so it's a simple number I'll uh, parameterize it call it roughness let me move this stuff out of the way and let's take this I'm gonna apply the changes I'm gonna change the the group to surface look and uh, apply the changes go back to the viewport I can see it's shiny now I can see I have a new parameter in the, um, the material instance editor called the roughness and I'll check that on so that I can use it and I'll just change the roughness so you could sit here and just do some look dev and just kinda look at your shader in the viewport and, and you can see what it's gonna look like in the final game this allows you to iterate um, much faster this increases your production time your efficiency it just lets you work a ton faster than before so that's kind of the power of material parameterization and material instances you want to make sure you're using this as much as possible don't kinda of go well that's cool and everything but I'm not gonna use it you definitely want to use this it's gonna make your workflow tens of times faster and easier if you're smart about this so I've got some stuff over here from a previous video called funky stuff and just to continue building upon this and show you how you could keep building up a, a complex uh, material parameterization setup I'm gonna take this and plug it into my world position offset which from an earlier video if you remember this makes uh, my sphere kinda of start wanting to dance so it's not doing much right now um, you can barely see it moving and the parameter that's changing uh, the movement is basically my offset amounts over here so I've got this cosine node over here kinda of giving me movement and the speeds being controlled by a number that's being multiplied by the time so what I can do is I can create another multiply node here plug in the results of the camera offset there I'll probably create another one vector or a one constant vector <clears throat> and I'm gonna go ahead and plug this stuff into the world position offset I'm gonna right click convert this one to a parameter so now I've got this constant uh, number I'm gonna call this bounciness which kinda makes sense but maybe I'll change it to something like funk factor that'll make a lot of sense for someone who's never edited this shader before imagine they get this material and they find a parameter called funk factor so I'm gonna go to the group and I don't like surface look so I'm gonna create a new group I'm just gonna call new group funky stuff and if this were animation you'd probably want to call this animation movement distortion something that makes more sense for a developer but I like to have fun with this stuff so I'm just gonna call it funk factor and you can see I have a new category up here called funky stuff and here's my funk factor I'm gonna check that on I'm gonna jump back to the viewport I'm gonna save and um, there we go now this guy's bouncing at a factor of 10 and I could take that and set it to zero to make it stop being funky or I could set it to two so it's a little bit less increase it to five ten so if I'm trying to see what I want to do here with this game I could just come in here and start changing these parameters to um, to adjust it to wherever I want it to be and I can do that extremely fast so I'm gonna take the this uh, node over here which is controlling the speed of the time at which this thing bounces so if I lower it from 2 to 0.5 you'll see the bouncing is a lot slower 
So we have one parameter controlling the amount of the bounciness. Now we have another parameter controlling the speed of that bounciness. So I'm going to call this, um, I'm just going to call it craziness. You can see I'm getting kind of silly with my naming here. Don't do what I'm doing. You want to use names that are logical and make a lot of sense, especially if you're working in, in a team, whether it's a large team or a small team. Last thing you want is for somebody on your team to get this material. and Maybe you're out on vacation or you're just not around. They need to edit this stuff. If they see a parameter called craziness, they're just going to be like, what in the world does this mean? I think this guy's crazy. But um, I'll just call it craziness. I'll increase that to 10. And you can see this thing's bouncing a lot. This would be great for like a music game and stuff, like I said before. But there you go. That That's pretty much it. Um, that's how material parameterization works. It's really simple to set up, super easy, takes a few seconds, uh, pretty straightforward. I strongly recommend you use this, take advantage of it. If you're not using this, then you're doing yourself a great disservice and you're slowing down your development time uh, immensely when it comes to materials. So that's pretty much it for material parameterization and material instances. Have fun.